Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's Cosmic Conversation. Today, we're going to be having a brief little conversation around accessibility and what you can do to self-advocate for your organization to take on more accessibility within the products that you create. And we have our guest speaker, our very own Tim Rue, who is a principal education and outreach specialist at Space Telescope Science Institute. Tim, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you, everybody. Um, so accessibility, uh, this is something that has been really important to me over the years. Um, it's been something I've been advocating for ever since I got here. Um, and I mean, it's something that the Institute cares about as well. We're trying to make the world's astron astronomical information accessible to all. Um, so there's 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 some stuff that we've been doing for a long time, which have been really good. And um, I'm proud to say that that I have been able to su successfully advocate for a number of changes here um, over the past two years. Um, so Jesse asked me a little bit just to talk a little bit about like what it is that that has helped me successfully advocate. Um, I guess maybe I should I should mention just a couple examples of some of the things that we've done here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things was revising how we do alt text for the images. So since we do the science operations for Web and Hubble, among other things, um, we produce those those images that go out to the public, the, and and that's a like one of the core pieces, um, everything, uh, not everything, but many, many of the uh, pieces that we create are centered around those. So if there are people out there who can't like see those images, that means they're missing a major portion of what we do. Um, so we revise those and uh, we work with an outside group, um, Prime Access Consulting, who, and we did some back and forth with them about writing different alt text. Um, and we did some practice with some non web images, but then we were able to roll this out with when the first web images came out. Um, was that just, just over a year ago? I don't know. I'm losing track of time. These that days. was just over a year wow. ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It feels so much longer um, <laughs> in some ways, but I so know. short in other ways. Um, but yeah, uh, those came out and and honestly, the, the, the community feedback that we got was really, really good. And actually, that's one of the things that has been really helpful in the advocacy is that with that success, we've been able to point to it and say, hey, look at all of the good feedback we're getting. Look at the media outlets that are coming to us to talk to us about this. Um, look at how NASA is reacting to all of this. And that kind of like encourages the success breeds success sort of piece to it. Um, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a big thing. And we had been building to that for a while. Um, yeah, there's been have. a lot of, yeah, there's been a lot of like culture change, um, just like having people realize the importance of this, mm -hmm. um, and how it's important, not just for people who like compl are completely unable to access it, but how a lot of this, this work makes the stuff we create better for Everyone, Everybody. even those people who already have access. Um, you know, universal design um, and universal design and learning um, are, are two of the concepts there, um, which I won't go into too much today, but those are worth looking up. Um, another thing that we've we've done a lot with is tactiles. Um, so we've actually got some tactile versions of some of the images that we have. And we've been doing tactile stuff for, for over a decade, at least. Um, a lot of them were raised line pieces. There were some 3D models and other things in there. Um, more recently, it has been these like full color images with um, the, the kind of the a representation of what the shapes are so that you can feel what that would look like. And actually the combination of the two, it, again, it feeds into that kind of universal design of learning sort of thing, that idea that, that well, this is going to help people who can not see anything. It's going to help people who can see a little bit because mm -hmm. they can kind of combine some of that color and that feel. Um, and also help people who can see just fine because it's bringing attention to particular details they may not have noticed before. Um, I had a really good conversation with an educator out in Utah. I don't remember which site, um, but she actually uh, is visually impaired herself. She can see color, but she can't really see shapes and other things. Okay. So this was like, it was eye-opening. I don't know if that's a good term to use. Um, but for her, because she was able to 
like really get a sense of what was in these things she had seen yeah, the color before or but more like yeah she it before yeah it's it's really cool it's like it's a spectrum of access i say and mm -hmm. everyone within that spectrum deserves to have access to the tools that we provide for sure yeah so some of the things that have really helped along the way um number one leading by example so there are the projects that i am in charge of uh, the ones that are, or the ones that I am assigned to. And with those small projects, just like trying to include accessibility in them every little bit. That way I can always point back to them and say, hey, this is what I did here. Look, it's possible. Um, if I make a slideshow, I'm writing alt text for each of those, each of the images in those slides, even if nobody out there is ever going to have access to the actual slideshow itself, just because it's a good practice and it's good. It, it it gets that the whole ball uh, rolling along there, um, but it means that I'm automatically thinking about this everywhere, um, and I can point to this. Um, being a squeaky wheel is really important, as it, it is in any sort of advocacy piece. Um, people are you're you're very rarely going to run up against someone who says no, I don't want to be accessible. No, I don't want to put this in. Y you will run up against people who like. Well, I don't know if we can manage that on top of all the other work that we've got to do yeah, with. No um, time. Mm -hmm. But people really do think it makes a lot of sense. And if you lean into some of the universal design pieces where it's making it better for everybody, I mean, it's it's a little bit sad sometimes, but that does bring a lot more people on because they see how it impacts them or the people that they see every day. Um, but that's part of it as well is, I mean, if you're if you're squeaking about it and you're you're pointing out examples of folks who, who can benefit from this Probably. um yeah they they can see oh yeah my grandma might really like this or 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 whatever else um one piece that's been really important here has becoming kind of the in-house expert i don't know that i'd call myself an accessibility expert but that's because i spend so much time like reading and, and looking around at the people who really are experts. Um, maybe I'm an adept. I don't know. Um, but I do have more experience than than uh, other folks here at the Institute. And being able to be that resource and say, yes, that works. That doesn't. Here are some particular things I can point you to. And, and all that um, does help. It makes it a lot less scary for people when they've got something to rely on. Um, yeah, having the examples so you don't have to start from scratch, I think, is huge because I remember Tim, when I started four years, four and a half years ago, and we were talking about alt text for like some of the first iterations of utilizing alt text. I had no idea where to start because I never made alt text before. And you're like, okay, I created some examples. This is how you can do a short one. This is the amount of text you need. This is the guidelines. Mm -hmm. I felt way more prepared at that moment than I did like five minutes prior when I was just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, and being able to practice as well off of each other. So like, I don't know if you remember, I'd write examples and send mm -hmm. them to you and then you would prove and then we'd go over it together and like finalize them. And that's a whole growing experience with learning how to create your own alt text. And then I took those tools and the next time I led a project right at the very beginning, I was like, okay, we need to have alt text. Like, you know, it's structurally, it loops in through through all of it. Yeah. I, I, and you know, you're also making me think back cringe a little bit but then remind myself it's okay because i remember the alt text that we were writing back then and it's not like what we were writing now no um that's what you do you grow you get yeah better. yeah i mean it was good advice at one point in time um there there actually had been better advice at the time below i hadn't hadn't found it um yeah. yet and um but yeah, I think we, that... we made mistakes but it got us in the mode of thinking about it and that's it got us it learning is. about it so it's yeah. okay it's okay. And I think a lot of people, when they think about accessibility and where to get started and what to do, they get so scared because they're like, I'm not an expert, so I can't do it. Yeah. Whereas it should be the complete opposite. You should just try and experiment and work at it until something clicks and you're getting something and producing something for your organization at a really good level. But of course, you're going to be evolving and tweaking it as you should because we're still tweaking our alt text i mean mm -hmm. we're still evolving yeah. it today so it takes multi-year and it's ever growing because there's always new guidelines too there's always yeah new yeah don't it's so easy to be intimidated but just start small do something and then yeah. build some momentum um yeah. 
there's so much out there, but it's okay. If you can take one little step, that's better than what you did before. Exactly. Uh, and and then you, you can, can start with just like one series of products too. Like you mm -hmm. can just have a guinea pig product yep. that you utilize for accessibility and start there. And you can use that to promote to leadership of why yes. you should have it for all your other products. Yep. Yeah. Celebrate successes, celebrate outside recognition of success, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um yeah. Um how how about so so I, this should be a conversation ideally um mm -hmm. have any of you done any particular work with accessibility or run into any particular challenges or have questions coming in today about any of this work where to look and how to begin that was like the two big ones for me when i started mm -hmm. i can let other people go if they have questions too And feel free to unmute yourself if you want to. Yeah, just jump in. While you're thinking, I will say, I, I do rec like the most basic thing you can do is make sure you've got text alternatives for what you create. So start with alt text. Um, it's easy. It's concrete. If there's an image, you can you can write some alt text for it. If it's on a web page, you can put it in there in the HTML. If it's in a PowerPoint file, PowerPoint lets you add in alt text. I think you right click on it and there's an alt text thing. Uh, same thing in Word or, or wherever else. And then if you just start practicing doing that, social media actually is a big one. Um, most, not all, of uh, the social media sites have a way for you to put in um, alt text. And it's, it's, it's easy and it can be simple. Even if it's just a dog, mm -hmm. that's better than not saying anything. Yeah, exactly. Just having having that extra resource. And this is something that you can even do with student groups too, like within your programming, like long-term programming, thinking of um, teenage programs, like folks who are look, working with people who are about to go to college and they are building products for you or alongside you about some kind of theme. You can start talking to them about accessibility right there as well. Like have conversations with younger audiences who are about to go off to university or further education or whatever else where it could be useful. Having those conversations with younger audiences is a fun way to experiment with it too, like the accessibility aspect of it. Like what is accessibility to you? What does that mean to you? And talking to younger audiences, you always get unique answers, I find. And it's always fun to to practice and train alongside them. So I wouldn't I wouldn't shy away from accessibility accessibility as it relates to program development and program engagement with your communities as well. It's, it could be a learning experience for you both. Mm -hmm. And then some other ways for accessibility. I think Jim was gonna ask a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. I, actually, I wasn't gonna ask a question. Uh, I was gonna apologize for being late and I hope this is relevant, but um, the Art Museum is part of a consortium that's doing the outreach for NASA's upcoming punch uh, solar mission. And uh, one of the outreach products they've developed is some tactiles uh, relevant to the sun. And I'm just about, I was trying to find the web page that talks about them and I'm about to put the link in the chat. Uh, but if awesome. anybody, and I'll put my email in there too. So if anybody's uh, interested in getting a packet of those uh, thermoforms, I can have the, I can help you out. Oh, that, that would be awesome. I'll probably put that to the Google group too, Jim. That's great. That, that, that reminds me as well. Um, are folks here familiar with Eclipse Soundscapes? That is a resource that will become rapidly relevant again in the next couple months. Um, so that may be something to pull up. Um, we have a just... couple of those for the annular eclipse here. Yeah. We had a couple of those stations running. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar, uh, it was a project uh, that put together that allows people to um, basically feel what's going on with a solar eclipse um, on a phone or a tablet or something else. Um, it'll have, there, there are a couple things. One, there are some images of an eclipse going through the different stages. 
and it has some haptic feedback. So as you put your finger on it, on the screen and move it around, it'll vibrate to different levels depending on uh, what you're covering. So you can get a sense of the shape of various things. And I believe when the eclipse was going on in 2017, um, that there was some live uh, information going on um, about what was going on. Although I'm not not entirely sure about that because I, I wasn't there using it myself then. Um, and I don't know what they're going to have going on uh, this coming April. But um, there's there's some really good resources for everybody in there. So that's a good one to, to look at. I also had a question, Tim, too, and around utilizing community experts that you're trying to reach. Um, what are some pros? Like, how can you initiate that? What does that look like? And the importance of doing that work as well. Yeah, so it's incredibly important um, because the people who have this lived experience who are dealing with it day in day out it's it, it's it's an, i don't know how many of you have been to one of those experiences where you go through a space as though you were blind or something like that but i mean that's something you do for a few minutes and then you're able to open your eyes and go on about your day um it's different when it's something that you have to live day in day out um I mean, yeah, uh, in, in a few different ways. Um, and there are a lot of aspects that you may not consider when you think about, like, what is it that you are doing from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night? Every little step, how is that impacted? How do all of those different pieces build upon each other as you go throughout your day, um, regardless of, of, of whatever experience it is that you're having? So including people who actually live that, is, is hugely important. Um, I mentioned that we involve those folks uh, from Prime Access Consulting, and they are folks who actually all have disabilities of one sort or another, um, in addition to a lot of um, web development experience and um, uh, accessibility um, consulting experience. So that was important for us. Um, but there are local groups that you can talk to. Um, I know there are, there are the national organizations like National Federation of the Blind and, and American Council of the Blind, um, but both of them tend to have local chapters, either in state or even smaller levels. Um, and they are a great place to reach out to and, and talk and say, hey, uh, can you help us? Um, we want to we want to talk with some folks in the local community. We want to figure out like what is the community like here? Where are people chatting? Um, how do we how do we invite people in? Um, it's it's important not just to take as well. I mean, talk with them about how you can work together to create something. They will have ideas about something that you had never considered. Um, there may be something that they want out of the whole experience, um, and that's probably more satisfying to to work towards because that's what your audience wants in this particular case um rather than um rather than just what you have had as a preconceived notion um and there are other groups that will have there, there are other communities and, and, and ways to reach out. Um, I, I mentioned those two because a lot of my, ex, a lot, not all, a lot of my accessibility work is focused on um, blind and visually impaired communities because so much of our materials are visual. Um, but um, there, are, there are all sorts of different groups that you could be working with depending on what your goals are. Um, but yeah, reach out to people, ask them, um, consider paying them if you can. Uh, that always helps, as with any sort of um, work when you're asking people to take on time. And um, it could be as simple, too, as if you do do alt text or anything else, you can have like a live feedback suggestion box somewhere, mm -hmm. either digitally or in your exhibit spaces if you're feeling daring. <laughs> but just, uh, just make sure your feedback method is accessible as well. Yeah, exactly. Are there any things that people here have tried to create themselves, whether it worked or not? Hmm. 
did you uh, talk about uh, low impact sensory type experiences? Because we have done a series of, uh, we, we opened the museum especially for, uh, they're called relax nights, or that's what we're calling them is relax nights. And mm -hmm. they're a uh, time when we don't let the, you know, robotic dinosaurs roar at people and, and the volumes turn down on things. And it's just a little bit low key for folks that um, are uh, have an issue with, you know, loud noises and things that would startle them and, and that sort of. And that's actually been yeah. really popular. We, we try to do one of those about every two or three months. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, there's actually a whole community of museums out there who do work like that, Sensory Saturdays or yeah. or other pieces. And we've had some really great successful programs through the Informal Learning Network around mm -hmm. that um, and yep. some great program models of how they've developed additional resources to support um, sensory days. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah, and yeah. sensory days and like and Jim was saying, they're 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 easy, not easy, but they're ways to engage your audience in different ways without expending budget. <laughs> so leadership will approve. You know what I mean? Like I'm always thinking about leadership and how to get that um, moving forward and doing something as making calm, relaxing, inspiring places more accessible is, is an easy way to get started. Oh, and I see ASTC created an accessibility toolkit for digital engagement at museums. That's really nice. I yep. will share that link on our Google group as well with the, with the recording alongside Jim's link for the tactiles as well. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. I remember looking through this when it came out and there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, so if yeah. you're looking for a place to start, this is a great one. Yeah, and I, I would just also emphasize that this toolkit um, also embraces the progress over perfection sort of idea that, mm -hmm. that Tim and others were, were talking about earlier. Um, it really just providing an opportunity to think critically, um, maybe for some folks for the first time, or maybe for folks who are looking for more resources, um, just to think about what are those ways that when we've created these digital programs and experiences that we hope are more widely accessible to folks who can't necessarily be in the museum space, what are those other considerations and adaptations you can make so that's even more friendly and opening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... Uh... If you're not knowing where to start, there are resources. So you're not alone in your ever mountain, ever growing mountain to climb. <laughs> yeah. There was something else that passed mm -hmm. through my head somewhere along there. It'll come back. <laughs> With the tactile images, that's something of a bigger ordeal to facilitate towards the images, using colored images. Yes. Creating them is definitely a bigger ordeal. Mm -hmm. um, we work with an outside company that has been doing this with museums for a while. Um, and I'm... I mean, they've done a fantastic job, but yeah, those are the <laughs> creating the process of actually creating the images can can be a little bit expensive. Um, mm -hmm. However, there are there are other ways to go about it. Um, Jim Jim's link in here actually is uh, using some thermoform. Um, so yeah, there are there are methods where basically you can print using a black and white laser jet printer and put it through a, on a particular type of paper and put it through this other machine that just basically heats it up and it'll puff up everywhere that it's printed. And that can be a really less expensive way to get something. It's not quite as detailed, it doesn't have all the color, um, but there are ways to do things. Um, but the other thing I would say is when doing some of these tactiles, facilit just like any museum program, facilitation helps so, so much. Um, that's particularly true with our images because like, Nobody, nobody knows what these these things are unless they've got a little bit of astronomy experience. Yeah, what's that behind Jesse? Um, it's it's orange and black and like an hourglass maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, I mean, I live here in this building, and 
I, I, I talk about this stuff every day, so I know exactly what that is. But just because I know doesn't mean the audience does, whether they can see or not. Um, yeah. So there needs to be some sort of interpretation of that. Um, it's easy for us to forget when we live in these places all of the time. I know we get comfortable with the terminology and the products and we sometimes forget not everyone sees this stuff every day and that should be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Another thing about accessibility to I wanted to ask, and I know we're right at time, so I'll ask it really quick, but um, when you are promoting accessibility to your teammates and you have people that are like, why are we doing that? why do we need to do that what what is what is some effective messaging you use to to get them on your side of understanding there's so two thoughts here and one of them was that thing that passed through my head a little bit earlier um i'll actually i'm going to start with that one um which is one you need people to help support you um we have here at the institute um something a, a group working group called envision um, which is focused on larger diversity, equity, access, and inclusion issues across the institute. Um, and I mean, we're looking at things from from race and gender to sexuality and disability and and uh, sensory issues and and a whole gamut. Um, and being able to have a whole group of people. This was pre-existing. Um, when I got here, um, and having a whole group of people who can help support this and who are who are going to be cheerleaders, and not only support in the advocacy amongst the institution, um, but also support um, like me as a person when I'm doing some of this work, and I can support them when they're doing that work emotionally um, is 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 really important. Um, so that's that's something to keep in mind, and coming back can you stay the question again so i can refocus myself jesse absolutely how can you successfully or how can you begin to advocate for having accessibility when you're on a team with someone who is like why are we even doing this right. why, why do we need to yeah it's going to depend on the person that you're advocating to um one some people like it's the right thing to do we want to get this out to everybody. Everybody deserves a chance to be able to access our content. Some people are going to be like, we're legally required to do this, or we can qualify for additional grants if we are doing this. And you tie in in, in money or laws or something like that. That's going to be the thing that triggers some people. And they're like, yes, I'm on board now. Um, sometimes it's going to be that if we do this, it's going to make it better for everyone, including you and me. Um, that universal design piece and some folks it's going to be like well here are some of the statistics about people with disabilities here's the 25 percent of people are going to have a disability at some point in their life including you um as you get older you're more likely this isn't this isn't a solid thing you're going to go you're going to break your arm and not have a hand and you're not going to be able and to type at your keyboard at one yeah. point anytime. you're going to, your hearing is going to go i mean these are these are things that do touch us even if they don't touch us personally you're they're touching like like getting a disability yourself they are touching people that you know um so different it's just like working with an audience out in the public you have to approach it in different ways depending on who it is um but those are the those are the most common ones that i'll use to to, to get people on board and one of them normally works that's good thank you tim mm -hmm. yeah i can I won't ask any more because I know you're over time. I was just, I wanted to ask that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a yeah. really important one. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Tim, for joining us today and everyone online. Thank you. We'll be sure to uh, share out our links with our group and everyone else who may need it. So thanks again. And be sure to check out next month's Cosmic Conversation. I'm forgetting the theme, but I will send it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming.